anyone here of a mind to answer the door? Yes. Sarah! Is she... Yes, milady. Asleep. This is the right place, then. Yes, this is her home. I'm her mother, Lady Phillips. Terribly worried. I'm here, Mother. I'm here. You found Father's letter? He's changed, hasn't he, Sarah? Yes, Mother, he has. He's got whiskers. <laughs> yes, so he wrote. He also proposes, if you and I agree, to reunite the family in America after the war. I know. How do you feel about the idea? The father certainly thinks we can make a go of it, but it would depend on how you feel. I write from the banks of the Ohio River, where our distinguished soldier of the Western Frontier, Colonel Clark, is building a fort at Louisville. The colonel is about to send a mission to request more aid from Governor Bernardo de Galvez of Spanish Louisiana. Hmm. Uh, uh. Sorry, James. Come, we're getting our marching orders from Colonel Clark. From here to New Orleans, then pass that to Mobile. It looks like a long way. And it is, farther than you can imagine. You sure you and Henri are up to it? For the story on Governor Galvez, sir, we'll go as far as we have to. Farther, even. Galvez is a story, all right. A soldier in the Spanish army when he was 16. He was promoted quickly and soon commanded the troops to fight the Apaches in the Spanish territories. Adelante! Not only did he win, but he was so gracious to his Apache captives that when word of his compassion spread among the tribes, it almost stopped the fighting. That Spaniard's been helping us fight the British by supplying us weapons, clothes, gunpowder, and money. Then, when Spain declared war last June, he captured three British positions on the Mississippi. He sure caught the attention of the English down south. And I want to continue doing that up here. The problem is, it takes weapons. But you have weapons. Not enough, James. Never enough. He's right. And what we really need is money. But don't you have... This? Hmm. <gasps> but... but... Counterfeit. The British print them by the ton. Almost no one will accept colonial currency anymore. Which is why Lieutenant Cross is going to Mobile. Galvez has powder. He has arms. He has money. Just let me gather myself for a moment. Who's this bill from? John Paul Jones, sir. He says it's urgent. Since the good ship Bonhomme Richard went down, everything with Captain Jones is urgent. Let's have it. At least this one looks fairly reasonable. <laughs> he wants a copper bottom for his new ship, the Alliance. I'm surprised he doesn't want to plate the ship in gold. <laughs> My dear Jones, by all means, continue your repairs. But for goodness sake, don't bankrupt me. Yours, etc. That ought to hold him for now. It feels odd to be out of uniform. Better to feel odd than to be caught by the British. Here's the list of what's required. Hand it to Galvez, and Galvez only. 
and guard it well. It's in plain English. No time to put it in code. Yes, sir. Henri? He's playing around in the woods. Henri! Come on, they're waiting for us. Henri? James, you'll never guess what I found! <gasps> My fellow members of the House of Commons, our monarch, George III, whose reign began in such shining circumstances, has seen his hereditary provinces of America erected into an empire that disclaims all connection with him. How sadly is the scene reversed. This is blasphemy. I guess he makes a point. Not only have his American colonies turned into rebels who dispute their connection with the Empire, but he is losing favor in the eyes of his own subjects. The nerve, the nerve of the man to speak of our king that way. For Charles Fox, for any Whig to speak of the king in such a manner. I agree with him. We've gone quite a long way down what seems to be the wrong road. Fresh gingerbread, me lady. But we cannot afford to lose the colonies. Can we afford to keep them? This war will surely bankrupt the kingdom. Oh! And if we do not win, there'll be no kingdom. Now, even the Irish cry for independence, Lady Phillips. I'm surprised by your air of defeatism. But, sir, I hardly think you can condemn someone as defeatist when the war is already lost. <gasps> With all due respect, of course. Hmm. The fighting may continue, but for Britain, America is lost. Have we been on this river? Twenty, I guess. I sort of lost count. I'm tired. You haven't slept for weeks, and the food is terrible. But the land, Henri, isn't it beautiful out here? Yes, but there's way too much of it. <laughs> What's the matter, Henri? Afraid we'll never reach Galvez? Not so many weevils today. Eat hearty, lads. This night marks the hardest part of the trip. Why? Are we sleeping on rocks again? Usually we travel during the day, pull ashore at night, but tonight there's no moon, so we move. Is that safe? Safer than trying to get past a strong point at Chickasaw Bluffs in broad daylight. The Redcoats check anybody they see on the river. We're not carrying anything suspicious. I mean, except for your secret letter asking Galvez for money and gunpowder and guns. Yes, like many things in war, this is a deed best done in darkness. Has something happened, Mother? Sir Henry Clinton. He's lost nine transport ships on the way to Charleston. All those poor boys. Boys who will not be forced to fight other poor boys. Sarah, I can't imagine what things you've seen. And you shouldn't try. Clinton's ships, where did they sail from? New York, I should imagine. Why? I was just wondering if ships were still sailing from here to America. In idle thought, that's all. Draw close by the east bank. 
All this just to meet the great Galvez? Stay down. any worse. It will if the English find the letter from Colonel Clark to Governor Galvez asking for more aid. Oh, no! Lieutenant Cross is being questioned right now! Don't worry. Lieutenant Cross hid it in the floor of the barge right after we fished you out of the water. He'll get us out of this. And you were taking these two? A trading post, just north of Natchez. Loyalists, sir. To a man. We couldn't take our goods north. No, sir. Too many rebels. And rebels have no money to buy. Well, sir, I will take your goods. Sure. Let's make a fair price. You misunderstand. I said take, not buy. But... Do you intend to stay? Because if so, perhaps we should discuss what you know of the many rebels upriver. That won't be necessary. We'll take our leave, sir. Thanks to you and your men for coming to our aid. Henri, can you walk? If I have to, I can run! You don't have to run, but we are getting out of here. Now. That guard, he found the letter to Galvez. He's opening it. Do they put everybody in jail, or just the one whose letter it is? Boy, I'm really glad you found that. It's a letter to my mother, kind of personal. Just a moment. I'm supposed to look things over. Everything. Right. Off with you, then. What just happened here? He couldn't read the letter. Not a word. How do you know? He was holding it upside down, like Henri used to do. Liar! I never did! Well, maybe sometimes. This is it. London to New York shipping agents. After almost two months, we finally caught up to Governor Galvez in Mobile. Lieutenant Cross has gone to see Oliver Pollard, Virginia's agent here, to arrange a meeting with him. Hmm. Looks like we missed all the action. Governor Galvez, this is the young journalist I was telling you about. Not me, James! I was just kidding. Welcome, Senor Hiller. And you must be Henri, the one who fell in the water. I can't help but notice the diverse makeup of your army. Are these all your men? Come, walk with me. Mm -hmm. 
I have professional soldiers, regulars drawn from regiments in Spain, Mallorca, and Havana. The Cubans have not forgotten the English occupation in Havana. I have fleet blacks and mulattoes, local militia, men, and even American volunteers. The local militia fight for their homes. Others, like the Indians, fight because they hate the English for giving weapons to their enemies. Sounds like the British made a lot of enemies. Fortunately, you're fighting for us. Make no mistake, amigo. I hope soon you'll have your America. But what I do, I do for my king and mother Spain. No one else. At last, Teniente, I can turn my attention to your request. With this signature, anything you require will be supplied. Thanks. Uh, where are you going after you take Mobile, Governor? <laughs> as far as the British will let me push them. East to Pensacola, into the sea, perhaps. Look at it this way. Each English soldier Galvez keeps busy down here is one less for General Washington to fight up there. Mm-hmm. Those will be much more impressive in a few weeks when they bloom. Spring, a new beginning. There's something new beginning, Mother, but it's not in England. Sarah. Here, we go by the old rules of class and custom. Most of our people simply can't be heard. Nonsense. You heard Charles Fox yourself in Parliament. I heard him, and Chatham and Burke, and Rockingham before him. And nothing has changed. We both know it. And your America will be different? They say it will be. I hope it will be. My dear, after the war, we'll join your father there. But for now... I can't wait. I've realized I'm part of this revolution. A small part, but I have to be there to see it to the end. That's why you went to Mr. Bentley, the shipping agent. You... you knew? Of course I knew, Sarah. I'm your mother. What am I to do? I suppose you should pack. Your ship leaves Portsmouth on Friday. Oh! Fuego! The English commander of Fort Charlotte was stubborn, but he was no fool. He knew relief wasn't going to get there in time. He defended his position against Galvez's superior force. To keep fighting would have been a waste of time. And men. It's off to New Orleans. We'll load our supplies and head up river to meet Colonel Clark. Doesn't it take longer to go upstream? Surely, we could mount a small sail. There's a lot of poling, rowing, rope toes from shore. How long? Four months. <gasps> Four? <laughs> I knew you'd feel that way. So I asked Governor Galvez to put you on a boat to Havana. You'll get a merchantman there and be in Philadelphia in a couple of weeks. Henri! Henri, did you hear that? We're... Henri? Ladies, a month chained below decks, all the fight out of them. They're Americans? They are. Another lot of bodies for Fulton Prison. Keep moving! We offered them a chance to join the Royal Navy. Instead, they chose the cells. What were they thinking? Of loyalty, perhaps. Patriotism. Huh? Best come away, miss. Courage. Mother, 
There's something I must tell you. What, dear? I feel I'm an American, too. Mother, as my long journey ends and I approach Dr. Franklin's Philadelphia, I grow increasingly uneasy. Though I believe deeply that I am where I belong, the pain of so recently leaving both you and father is, I must admit, difficult to bear. James Moses on Henri think of me now. Probably that I am a silly girl who keeps changing her mind about who she really is. are still so high, Moses. I don't see how we can... Moses? Sarah? Uh, hi. Sarah! <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, what? Why? Because I finally realized something. I realized I am an American. Welcome home. It's about time, isn't it? James, I feel so wonderful, even you can't ruin it. What? H hey! Aren't you glad to see me? <laughs> <laughs> I have so much to tell you about. John Paul Jones, and England, and Mother, and Parliament, uh... and two ocean journeys with the worst food I ever ate, and... Hmm... Where's Henri? I thought that... That's it! Hey! Stop it! Ow! No. <laughs> Take it back! Never! You are a liar! I am not! Stop it, both of you! Sarah? No! I'll show you! Henri, he's just saying that to make you angry. I am not! Well, if he is, it's working! Stop it! Now! Now, how did this start? When Charles said bad things about Dr. Franklin, I said, take it back or else! He wouldn't, so I taught him a lesson he'll never forget! Ha! 
Doesn't Charles have the right to his own opinion, even if you disagree with it? Yes, but... That's part of being free. Haven't you learned anything from Moses and Dr. Franklin? I guess. Then maybe you should apologize for starting the fight. I'm sorry I punched you first. But you're wrong about Dr. Franklin! I am not! Stop shouting! Why do you think Dr. Franklin is a fraud and a blowhard? I don't know. My dad told me. I want to show you something. Look around, Charles. What do you see? Junk? See? In a way, he's right, Henri. It used to be junk. Until Dr. Franklin got his hands on it. Did you know Ben Franklin is an inventor? No. Moses, play for him. Play for me, please. Truce? Fine. Fine. All right, then. This is an invention of Dr. Franklin's called the glass harmonica. See how the different sized glass bowls turn together as I rotate the crank? And when I touch the edge of one of the bowls, Thank you kindly. Moses, tell him about this. Do you know what this key did, Charles? Uh, unlock the door to the crown jewels? <laughs> Not exactly, but it opened another door to a new world of electricity. It was in 1752 when Dr. Franklin was 46 years old. As soon as any of the thunderclouds come over the kite, the pointed wire will draw the electric fire from them. When the rain has wet the twine so that it can conduct the electric fire freely, you will find it stream out plentifully from the key on the approach of your knuckle. He got sparks! So what? For one thing, in case you don't believe Dr. Franklin is a man of courage, the next man who tried the same experiment died. And what a discovery Dr. Franklin made! As we learn to control those sparks, we'll be able to use their energy to power boats. Or drive carriages without horses. Or even help to cook, Charles. Dr. Franklin tried it once. Like many scientific experiments, it did not work out well. It was two days before Christmas. Dr. Franklin was hosting a dinner party. Why Dr. Oh. Franklin's inventions are fascinating. That is so very. I have a Franklin stone. Oh. Oh. You know, oh. the oh. oh. He did not like to see an animal suffer needlessly and hoped to use electricity to end its life painlessly. Oh. 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 Dr. Franklin! Let me help. Oh, my! Are you all right? Oh, yes, perfectly fine. <laughs> I want to try that! Yeah! Absolutely not. Electricity can be very dangerous. James's parents died in a fire started by an electrical storm.
To prevent fires started by lightning, Ben invented this. A lightning rod. With Ben's new device attached to the roof, the lightning bolt was attracted to the point of the rod. The electricity traveled down a copper wire into the ground. Of course, in Ben's house, he sent the charge through an apparatus that rang some small bells. In a large storm, the bells could ring for hours. I want to invent things like Dr. Franklin someday. Me too. I wish I had a fancy education like he did. Fancy education? Let me tell you about Ben's fancy education. What kind of lies are you filling my son's head with? Come here, Charles. They're not lies, sir. Would you like to hear for yourself? I insist on hearing for myself, so I can be sure to correct them. Charles just told us Dr. Franklin had a fancy education. Wonder where the kid heard that. Sir, that is simply not the case. Dr. Franklin grew up in Boston, directly across from Old South Church, in a home filled to bursting with 12 brothers and sisters. Ben was crushed to learn his family could no longer afford to send him to class. He was nine years old. Like this, father? His father put him to work in the family business, making candles. Ben spent the money he earned on his greatest love, books. Ben Franklin had no fancy education, Charles. Ben Franklin taught himself. Does your family borrow books from the Library Company of Philadelphia, Charles? Of course. Ben Franklin founded it, along with the American Philosophical Society, the Union Fire Company, the College of Philadelphia, and the Pennsylvania Hospital. Charles, have you ever had the misfortune to be sick or injured? Never. The boy's strong, like his father. You're both lucky. And if you lived in the days before Dr. Franklin founded that hospital, being healthy would have made you even luckier. Many poor, ill, and insane people were reduced to wandering the streets of Philadelphia. It was a terrible situation. <coughs> Pennsylvania Hospital, there's a place for the sick. Just as importantly, people started learning how to be doctors. This awful war gave them a chance to learn firsthand about the human body. Seeking to ease the terrible suffering, they've taken to the battlefields. There, they've been confronted with every injury and sickness you could imagine. And then some. Thanks to our doctor's newfound experience, people are being cured of illnesses and healed from injuries in ways that were never possible before. Mr. Montgomery, did you ever read Dr. Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac? Hmm. Dr. Franklin published the first edition of Poor Richard's Almanac when he was 26 years old. 
It contained all the usual weather reports, recipes, and predictions. What set it apart were the lively writing and witty sayings. A penny saved is a penny earned. There are no gains without pains. A learned blockhead is a greater blockhead than an ignorant one. He that lies down with dogs shall rise up with fleas. Library, philosophy, college, almanacs, all very amusing. But my money's no longer worth anything. I'm tired of this war. And Ben Franklin, as much as any other man, started us on this road to ruin. Mr. Montgomery, you have to understand where Dr. Franklin's deep commitment to freedom comes from. He wrote, in 1717, my brother James returned from England. With a press and letters to set up his business in Boston. I signed indentures when I was but 12 years old to serve as an apprentice for the next nine years of my life. Presenting this week's issue of the New England Current. Featuring the latest column by Mrs. Silence Dogood. Listen, I reflected in my mind on the extreme folly of those parents who, blind to their children's dullness and insensible of the solidity of their skulls, will need send them to the temple of learning, by which she meant Harvard College. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? It's very funny, all right. I'd love to know who this sharp-tongued lady really is. James, I am Mrs. Silence Duguid. I've been writing that column and slipping it under the door in the middle of the night, watching everyone laugh at my words, but never being able to take credit for them. Do you know how that feels? James grew increasingly abusive with his 17-year-old brother. Aren't you finished yet? I don't want to be here all night. I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. You idiot! You did that on purpose! It was an accident. I don't believe you! And I've had enough of your disrespect! Dr. Franklin left soon after. He never forgot his brother's harsh and tyrannical treatment, Mr. Montgomery. That's where Dr. Franklin got that aversion to arbitrary power, which that has stuck to me through my whole life. It's also one of the reasons he's taken such a strong stand against slavery. Slavery is the economic foundation of our southern states, and many of us in the north have made our profits from slave labor, too. With all respect, sir, whoever freed you made a mistake. That said, I admit you do make solid points about Benjamin Franklin. You are entitled to your opinion about slavery, sir, though by what you say, you would deny me mine. Where's Charles? Where's my son? And where's Henri? <laughs> Look out! I can't control him! Henri! Sarah! I almost didn't get to hear you tell me about your trip. Uh, oh. Moses! Thank you, sir. I am glad you are a free man. You are welcome. And I hope someday you will say that to an African man who did not just save the life of your son. James, Sarah, and Henri. I know you wish you could see me, but as you can't, I will describe myself to you. Figure me in your mind as jolly as formerly, and as strong and hearty, only a few years older. 
very plainly dressed, wearing my thin gray straight hair that peeps out from under my fine fur cap. Think how this must appear among the powdered heads of Paris. Still, they mob me. On behalf of the British Crown, I would be most... Good evening. I don't believe it. Oui, Sacre bleu. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> Dr. Bergen, Ben Franklin at your service. Dr. Franklin, what a surprise. Welcome to Versailles. A man of my years is happy to be welcomed anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you this, there have been unknown people as great as any of the most famous. However, my dear friends, if you would not be forgotten as soon as you are dead and rotten, either write things worth reading or do things worth writing. And children, I am quite certain that you shall. My dearest Abigail, I write you from France for what may be the last time. Congress, in its infinite wisdom, has chosen not to reappoint me to my diplomatic post. After 18 months away, I'll be coming home. My letters have been restrained. It's only for fear they would be stolen by the British. But Abigail, do not doubt my love for you. It is all I have left. Your dearest friend, John. Take heart, John Adams, and don't count this adventure a failure. Thank you, Doctor, for all your kindnesses. Not at all. If I may have a word with John Quincy. By all means. John Quincy, one day the state of our new nation will rest upon the shoulders of young lads like you. In the meantime, try to have a little fun. Climb a tree, fly a kite. Yes, sir, Dr. Franklin, but I do think I shall be better off learning physics. Of all my accomplishments, the one I'm most proud of, I learned as a boy. Do you know what that is? No, sir. There's your physics. Remember, John Quincy, lost time is not found again. Better check your pie, Sarah. I do believe apple is my favorite. It's John's as well. Mother, remember how much he loves mince pie? I'd almost forgotten. If I don't see him soon, I swear I shall forget his face. How long has it been since you last heard from him? It seems like months. I don't know how much longer I can carry on without him. Why did he only send me two letters in 18 months when I wrote him dozens? Ow! Ow! Henri Lefebvre, that serves you right. Mrs. Adams, look! Abigail! Oh, John! Father! Father! <laughs> oh, my boys. Look at my boys. Oh, my dear John Quincy. <laughs> it's so good to see you. We missed you. Oh, Father, I'm so glad you're home. <sighs> John Adams, you're much too old to be climbing trees. Nonsense. Got it. Uh oh. John, are you all right? Not even bruised. 
Honestly, what am I going to do with you? Keep me here, put me to work. At least I know I'll be appreciated. For you, darling. I know it sounds selfish, but I'm tired of sharing you with Congress, Paris, and the Revolution. After all we've been through these last few years, I understand. And Father sent me to the finest école in Paris. That's French for school. Say something else in French. Tell us you like to eat fish. That's easy. <coughs> J'aime manger le poison. <laughs> and what is so funny? You just said you like to eat poison. <laughs> Did not. Did do. Le poison, poison. Le poisson, fish. What do you know? Have you ever been to school? Do you know Latin or Greek? Have you studied physics or chemistry? No, but I know how to catch birds and toads. <laughs> <laughs> Just as I thought, you don't know anything, do you? General John Sullivan? Why, if it isn't James Hiller from Dr. Franklin's newspaper. I hope this isn't a bad time. Not at all, me lad. I heard that Congress ordered you up here to fight the Iroquois. Only because General Washington called it a necessity. After what they did to the families at Wyoming and Cherry Valley, men were deserting in droves so they could go home to protect their loved ones. Have you done any fighting yet? We engaged the Redcoats and their Mohawk allies outside of Newtown just a few days ago. Ah! Our cannons sent them running like rabbits. I was hoping we'd capture their murder-in-chief, Colonel Joseph Brandt, but so far he's managed to slip away. Joseph Brandt? Aye, he's the prize. The devil that fought against us in General Burgoyne's army. He was there when they massacred all those women and children at Cherry Valley as well. How do you plan on capturing him? I have an army of 4,000 men. We'll find Brandt even if it means scorching the earth between here and Canada. Would you mind if I wrote a story about it? Why not? After all, it could make me a national hero. John Adams? Honestly, how could he have let his clothes get into this state and present himself to the court at Versailles? Abigail! Massachusetts! Holding a convention! Drafting a new constitution! Slow down, John. It's exactly what I envisioned. Nothing like this has ever been done before. The citizens themselves will actually have the chance to vote on it. As they should, but what does that have to do with us? The good people of Braintree have asked me to be a delegate. But you've barely been home a week. The convention's close by, and I'll be only one of 250 delegates. If your country needs you, I suppose you'll need this. think she'd be happy. You should see some of their castles. That's what the Iroquois call their villages. Living better than we do. Of course, that'll change after the war. Will you really destroy everything? The Iroquois Confederacy had their chance to join us. But that devil Brandt convinced four of the six Indian nations to side with the British? But what if you're destroying crops that belong to the Indians on our side? Fortune's a war, me lad. Fortune's a war. Look at it! <laughs> 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 How am I supposed to prepare for Harvard with all this racket going on? 
Maybe you'd like to try. Don't be ridiculous. Tell you what. I'll teach you how to fly it if you help me with my reading and writing. Are you seriously proposing to trade my knowledge for yours? I'll even toss in my own method of catching toads. Unless that's something you're going to learn at Harvard. Oh, I'm sorry I laughed at you. What do you say? Well, I suppose we could try it. Great! Here. What do I do now? Have fun! Was that you I saw flying a kite today, John Quincy? I was merely interested in the physics of it. <laughs> <laughs> Abigail, children, I have good news to share. The convention was a shambles until I arrived. Then the delegates formed a committee of 30 men to draft the Constitution. That committee, in turn, chose a subcommittee of three men who, naturally, picked me. That's splendid, John. Uh, might we talk outside for a moment? It's nothing. Just uh, continue eating. I thought you'd be pleased at the honor. I am, John, as I've always been pleased at the work you've done for the revolution. But how much longer will this go on? You left me for 18 months. Now that I've gotten you back, I don't want to lose you again. I'll work here at home. Shut away in your office. I understand, John. I really do. But what about the children? Little Thomas barely knows you. Look at me. How could John Adams, leader of the American Revolution, turn down the chance to write a document that may very well serve as a model for a new nation? What about John Adams' father and husband? When do I get that John Adams back? How could we have done this? What? <gasps> what are you doing here? I, I, I'm a journalist. Writing a story for a newspaper. I am Tayan Danagea of the Mohawk Nation. I had nothing to do with this, I swear. No, just those you write about. General Sullivan's army is only doing this because Chief Joseph Brandt and his Mohawks massacred women and children at Cherry Valley. What do you know of that? Come with me, journalist, and soon you will see which side is truly savage. into greatness. This and no other is the root from which a tyrant springs. Should I keep going? That's quite enough for one day. Now it's my turn. What would you like to do first? Climb a tree or catch a toad? Hmm, catching a toad would be quite a dirty business. Let's do that. What do you see here? Trees? A river? Farmland? You see with a white man's eyes. I look and I see the past. Once thousands of my people prospered here. Six nations formed the mighty Iroquois Confederacy. Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora. Now because of the Bostonians, that time is gone forever. The Bostonians? That is my name for John Adams 
and the other American revolutionaries, the ones who seek to make of this their nation and who will take this land that was meant for all to share. Have you ever thought of writing about that? But the English are far worse. Are you hungry, journalist? I suppose. I will fill your belly with a tale of the English and Joseph Brandt. I'm sorry if my mood is dark, Sarah. With your permission, Mrs. Adams, may I speak from my own experience? By all means. After not seeing my father for so many years, not knowing whether he was alive or dead, I had to leave him in Ohio. Then I went to England to be with my mother, only to leave her again as well. It's because of the war, Mrs. Adams. The fight for liberty. Thank you for reminding me of what I'd almost forgotten. These are indeed times that call for great sacrifices, but even more so for great strength and understanding. Joseph Brandt was raised by an Englishman, Sir William Johnson, Britain's superintendent of Indian Affairs. Sir William brought Joseph to Connecticut, sought his education, even married his sister. Joseph joined the Anglican Church and even translated part of the Bible into the language of our fathers. Have you been to England? No. Joseph Brandt, as chief of the Mohawks, sailed there on an English ship. He saw plays by Shakespeare. He even broke bread with King George. The British warned Joseph Brandt that the Bostonians would steal our lands if we remained neutral. Our mothers and sisters were afraid. What would you have done in our situation? I don't know. Joseph trusted the British and the promises to protect us. Yet by siding with them, we have given the Bostonians good reason to take our lands. Like a prophecy come true, we have brought our own destruction upon our heads. John, will you walk with me? Now reach under and grab it! Go on! Got it. I dub thee King George. Across this river is the great castle of my people. The nights grow longer and the days colder. Tell me, journalist, what will my people eat this winter? Where will they live? We supplied food for the British soldiers. Who will feed us now? Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. William Shakespeare, the English playwright, once I thought to translate his words as well. Now there seems no point. You, you're him. You're Colonel Brandt. Well, why didn't you want me to know? One can only tell the truth when he has seen it with both eyes. What a story. I've written about the form of government and its guarantees, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and so on, yet something is still missing. If I may. You know how much I value your thoughts. Perhaps you need to include a section that captures not just the form of government, but, but its hopes and dreams for our people as well. Yes, yes. But what are those hopes and dreams? <laughs> Let early education be a source of amusement. You will then be better able to find out the natural bent. I quite agree. Don't you, King George? Of course. It shall be the duty of this Commonwealth to cherish the interests of education, of literature and the sciences, of public schools and grammar schools in the towns, to encourage the arts, 
to promote the principles of humanity and general benevolence, public and private charity, honesty and sincerity, good humor and generous sentiments among the people. see why not. Let's see. My dear Sarah, I trust this letter finds you safe and well at Dr. Franklin's in Philadelphia. Very good, Henri. The children all miss you and Henri very much. They miss me. The constant, constant, here, you can read this part. The Constitutional Convention unanimously ratified John's document, and the people of Massachusetts will soon vote to accept or reject it. As I write this, I must tell you how empty the House feels now. Congress wrote to John asking him to return to France to negotiate a peace treaty with Great Britain. Without so much as a word to me first, he accepted. Charles is old enough to go with him now. John Quincy, however, wanted to stay here with me. I told him these are times in which a genius would wish to live. It is a time when great character is formed. Thank you, Sarah, for helping me remember that great necessities call out great virtues. All will be well. <laughs> 